Like I'll, I'll do anything that gets me inspired. Anything that kind of like causes those lightning bolts, you know? As soon as I found music, I was like, that's me, you know, like that's my identity. It's like a rush of identity. You know? Is it true you got high on mushrooms and buried all your arias in the backyard? <laughs> So this new album, Kevin, which is amazing, start to finish, and I love, I love it. And Thanks, I think man. You've, you've achieved something beautiful with the slow rush. Is that an LA album? Was that kind of made here? I mean, like not intentionally, but I mean, like I started recording it here, like I was renting nearby. Mm. The more I kind of started just making little demos and tunes and stuff, the more I like got into the idea of it being my LA album. You know, just like in the cheesy way, I was like, oh, it feels cool. Like every artist should have their LA album. I agree. You know what I mean? And I think artists should absolutely immerse themselves in whatever the geography or the environment is they make music. I get, get confused when, when, when musicians are like, ah, oh, you know, I just recorded it in a, in a random studio in a random city. And I'm like, how is that impacting the overall result? Well, you know? I, I still do believe that at the end of the day, geography shouldn't have anything to do with it. I have never consciously been aware of it. You know, like so much of the music I started making, I made in like my bedroom in a really dirty share house in a very unglamorous part of like WA, you know. And I was kind of making, to me, was I was trying to make the most kind of beautiful music that I could. In this shitty environment. To try and sort of like get it out of there, you know what I mean? Like yeah. to, to try to like, to, as a kind of a fantasy thing. When I actually started recording the album, we like, we had this beautiful place. In a speaker, we, you mean? In a speaker, yeah. yeah, when we like rented this kind of beach shack mansion, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is like, of course you're gonna do that when you get a bit of budget, you're like, That's where the can first, we... That was the only thing I asked for in the budget. They were like, okay, what do you, like, you know, yeah. which producer The you... environment did matter to you. You were like, I wanna go there, even if it's just a surf, you know? Sure, well, I, I mean, I was, I was obviously like, in love with the whole idea of it. Because I'd just been recording in my bedroom with a pair of headphones, yeah. I was like, oh, let's get somewhere beautiful, you know? But the thing that I learned immediately was that as soon as you're in this beautiful environment making music, everything already sounds beautiful because of what you're looking at. Like I had this like ocean view. Yeah. So just like strumming my guitar once oh. was like, oh, that's all I need to do, you know? Yeah. So it made me realize that like- But it may not translate to me, the listener, because I'm not staring at Exactly. I was like, hang on, there's something to be said for being in a really kind of drab environment because it makes you work harder to get the music you want. I don't know, I have this feeling, seeing as how you brought it up from the beginning, it's kind of a nice way to start because we'll get to the slow rush soon enough and there's a lot to dissect mm -hmm. there. But I always got the feeling that you sort of had worked out how you wanted things to sound before you even worked out what you wanted to create. Sometimes, yeah, it's a range. Like sometimes, uh, that's something I've always been kind of proud about or like that I've had a sense of pride about, you know, is like some, sometimes I'll just think of a song. In a way, it's fully formed in my mind, you know, because it's, like, it's kind of just like flicking on the radio. You know, so I'm like, oh, that's how I want it to sound. The drums have to sound like that. The bass is at this level. Bass line is, like chunky, yeah, it's heavy, yeah, exactly. What really shocked everybody was when the first EP came out, we started hearing music on the radio, um, which had come from your MySpace site, mm -hmm. was how it sounded so authentic. Like, it was one of those kind of weird moments, even in the internet age, where people were like, is this real or is this an old band that we've all forgotten about or no one knew? Mm -hmm. It's like, for a minute, no one could quite tell. Yeah. Were you sort of proud of that in a weird way? Was authenticity, or was like, like, so that it sounded a certain way from a certain era part of the process in the beginning? I think it was something that I was attracted to. Because back then, like, I had even less of an idea of what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I like to think I've never really had much of an idea of what I'm doing. Because I think that's kind of like, that's, that's part of the essence of it, is like not, not really knowing what you're doing, you know. And that's kind of a scary place to be when you're on your own for most people, or do you find that kind of comforting? Diving? It's exciting. That's yeah. when you know you, that's, new, that's when you know something's happening. Exactly. When, when you're like, I'm not really sure what I'm doing here. Like, when you're right on the edge of what you're capable of doing. So you know how do you I mean? know when you got it? How do you know when you sort of got it into a place where it's right for you? For me, it's like, it starts out as feeling like I've got it and then it gets less and less, and less and less confident from the start. Like the first night that I work on a song is when I'm feeling the best about it. And then it's just getting to the finish line from there. I know what I have to do physically to finish the song, record vocals and all that kind of stuff. The sort of prevailing theme of this album, if I could be kind of broad, at least, is time. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it starts with one more year and it ends with one more hour. Yep. That almost suggests a concept record in a weird way. Whenever you put a bolt hold at the beginning and end of something, it's like, all right, everything in the middle ends here. I like that it feels like that because I like albums that have this kind of arc and have this, you know, like some of my favorite albums are concept albums, like uh, Grand Don't Come For Free. Yep. 
That's almost the perfect concept album. It's 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 in a way it's the only real concept album. <laughs> Every other concept album is less of a concept it album. It feels like an afterthought. Like, oh no, it is a concept album. Oh no, it's not a concept it, album. Well, you know, from start yeah. to finish, you yeah. know. Yeah. But like, I don't want people to think that that this is a concept album because it's it, it like it's not. It's not. But I, I I like that it has that arc. You know, like a start and a finish. It has I like a that. prevailing theme to it though. Which is kind of um, yeah. the idea of time and what's relevant, what's important, um, what seemed irrelevant before is relevant now. Yeah. All the things that change shape as we grow mm. um, and how memories can actually change shape and things can alter. And it's really about the yeah. perception of time or, or what happens in the time. Isn't exactly. It? It's like how we as humans are affected by time and just like things that happen in our lives, situations that occur from the fact that we are these blobs of flesh moving through time you know like time happens to us and accumulating it's like as we go yeah exactly for you to come to a, some kind of conclusion that this would play a part thematically in the record what was sort of the the triggers for that that observation that turned itself into some sort of subject matter well it's always been something that's kind of been interesting to me I guess like getting married getting married really makes you feel like you're at this point you know it just makes you see the big picture and it's kind of just one of those things that just, like, above all else, it just makes you think, just makes you feel a particular way. Yeah, I mean, there's that feeling right at the beginning of the album. It has a sense of kind of uh, this euphoria, but also this, like, we need to make the most of this time we have. Um, talk us through what One More Year is. I mean, without destroying the mystery of it, but just give mm -hmm. us some, some broader idea about what you were trying to achieve with that song. It's kind of about deciding, well, like, realising that you've found yourself in a kind of a stale part of your life, you know? Like you're in this kind of like perpetual routine kind of thing and it's like you're, too, you're stuck in your comfort zone and like the only way to break out is to decide to just give it one more year, you know? It's like, it's like talking to your friends going like, hey guys, like let's just do what we do for one more year, you know what I mean? And then like after that time we will we'll get our lives in order. You know, let's just be crazy for one more year. Yeah, but in that, that's ultimately a process of letting go, right? Which is when things get exciting again. Exactly, exactly. It's really a wonderful piece of music to start with. I feel like you built it around that whole chant at the beginning. What came first? What was the... Well, I knew I wanted that to be the first song mm. from the moment I started working on it. From the vocal? How important was the vocal to that? The vocal that sort of like moves through a gate? The slow one more year that goes through the gate. It's funny, some people don't know that that's a vocal. Some people just think it's some weird <laughs> Gregorian choir, you know? Like that didn't even come first. Just the, like, was just the essence of it. Wow, that's crazy to me because I would just imagine you would come up with that vocal, somehow land on that, stretch it out, put it through a gate and go, I gotta build a song around this, you know what I mean? How do you even find the room to put this super slowed down, multi-layered, deep vocal through a gate over something that you've already kind of created and con conceptually in your head? I don't know. I, it would have, I mean, it would have been late one night, you know, very late. I think I was just finding something to bind it all together. To put you it know? together. It was more just the groove. I think it was like the bass line, the groove, and the kind of the idea of just like that kind of weird, like talking over a song. Like I, I, I love, I love spoken word mm. music, but I can never, I never have the courage to just do it myself. You know. So for me, it's kind of like I like that it's kind of like talking but singing. You talked about that process of letting go or being willing to abandon something to run the risk of losing it or re or regenerating it. Have you ever felt that way with? in the musical landscape with what you've been doing, that it's become routine? Sure, yeah. I always am aware that if I do what I'm good at already, it won't be fun or exciting. The idea of doing, doing what I'm already good at and doing it well is kind of just so boring because it's, it's always got to be a little bit frightening. Like I know that I know that like, if I do what I'm good at, it will uh, get played by these radio stations or like certain fans will like it. I think they'll only like it for a small amount of time. They'll realize it doesn't have that energy that it would if it's something that I feel really excited well, about. There won't be anything really to pick can't. at. There won't be anything to pull apart and, redis and discover yeah. for the first time. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you're right. It's like it's a quick fix. It's, a, it's like a quick burst of adrenaline that when you hear someone do something, the same thing over and over again, unless it's ACDC. In which case, <laughs> exactly. that, that adrenaline never gets exactly. tired, ever. Hit me with that every single time, please. You took some time in between currents in this record, but you didn't take any time away from making music. You just sort of went into this really kind of, seemed what it, was, it, it felt from the outside like it was just a really free collaborative space. Mm -hmm. That you were just kind of open to taking calls mm -hmm. and moving into new environments. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it now, like, how was that kind of year or 18 months of just moving from one studio to the other and 
fucking around with other people's shit, you know? It was kind of a blur, you know? Like, it's funny, I um, only really realized it had been like four years or whatever since I'd done an album. At one point, I was like, wow, it's actually been that, that amount of time, you know? Mm. Because um, like I was having fun, but I was kind of like, I, had, I was kind of just testing the waters, you know, just, and just doing kind of like things as they came to me. Like, I didn't really have a grand plan or anything. It's just like if someone reached out to you, you'd consider it and then do it. Yeah, do exactly. It. I just wanted to see what else was out there, you know, like I wanted, wanted to be a DJ, you know. How was that? I you wanted... and Mark going back to back, was it fun? Yeah, it was fun, that was great. He's a generous still... collaborator on stage. He'll give you the space to DJ. That's like... true. It's tough standing next to him, like trying to be a DJ though. Yeah, I know. Someone, uh, someone like that. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, like, you know, that's still something I still want to do because I, I find it so interesting. Well, it must be a good way for you to test out what works in front of a crowd and just just hear different sonics and sounds. Yeah, and it uh, it changes the way you appreciate music, like playing music for people. Mm. And when I say playing it, like playing yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Like selecting. Uh, yeah, you're right. You 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 hear different things. I feel like you spent quite a bit of time in the studio with Mark, helping him. You know, you've definitely contributed to um, both of his latest solo records. Mm -hmm. You can definitely hear your melodies. You've got such a unique m melodic approach that you can hear them no matter who's singing them. You can hear in the Camila Cabello song that it's you that came, oh, up, came up with the hook. What did you sort of learn from working with him? So much, so much. I guess just his approach to working with people, because like I've never worked with people before. He was yeah. kind of like, I was kind of like his understudy in that way. Just his sort of uh, dynamic with people, like him being able to be himself but he's able to do so many different things and work with so many different people, you know, and I find that so admirable. Just the way he, he's, he's dynamic with, with people. Like him being able to say what he wants without sounding arrogant, you know what I mean? Let's talk about working with Travis Scott and mm -hmm. working in that environment. One of the things I love about Travis is that he's got amazing taste. Yeah. You know, not just in his own music, but he loves really dialed in sh <laughs> Totally. You know, totally. The no, people it's... he chooses to work with are really, are really on point. Can you give us sort of an idea of what that experience was like or what the environment was like when you were working with him? It was awesome. He's so enthused by ideas, you know? Like if he, if he has an idea or if, he, or if someone has an idea he's into, he'll just like go for it. Do you that. Know? He doesn't waste time kind of doubting himself or doubting things, which is extremely valuable. Because you need that burst of um, conviction. Mm. Conviction is the word. I try to uh, take on some of that conviction when I'm working because like doubt and all that kind of stuff is poisonous in um, creativity. Have you doubted yourself in the past whilst you made your music? Always, So yeah. in, a way, in a way, you've kind of, we've been the ones that have had the conviction in what you do as fans. Totally. So it must be a surprise when you, when you go from playing barefoot on a stage in front of a few hundred people to within a few years, you're kind of headlining festivals. That's a lot of conviction that people are showing you. Yeah, but I mean, like, that's the funny thing about, you know, like self-confidence, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter how many people are screaming at you, you know. If you're doubting yourself, you're doubting yourself and that's it. You know? Did you have moments in front of like 20, 30,000 people when you felt like it wasn't your place or you were faking it a little bit because of that? Uh, yeah, sure, that happens. But I mean, like, playing live is playing live, you know. Even if it's a bad gig, it's still, it's still an electric vibe, you know. When a gig feels the worst, it still just feels like you're playing sport. You know, it feels like a sport match, which is still fun, I, I imagine, you know. <laughs> you were never a sports guy? No, not quite. What, you can't tell? You grew up in Perth. I mean, it's an outdoorsy kind of place. Well, compared to the average Australian, I didn't play a lot of sport. Was it weird being a music obsessive when you were a young kid in a place like Perth, which is kind of, and in a country like Australia, which is so sporting obsessed? Obviously, it felt different, but that's kind of what I liked about it anyway, like how much of an individual it made me feel. As soon as I found music, I was like, that's me, you know, like that's my identity. It was like a rush of identity, you know. I guess probably because I'd been searching for something. Because probably I didn't like playing soccer at lunchtime, you know what I mean? There was a lot of honesty buried in there from the get-go. I think people got so obsessed with the sound of Tame Impala that they initially didn't recognize exactly how much honesty was certainly on inner speaker. I mean, and it's not meant to be, and, and please excuse me if I got this the wrong way, but mm -hmm. I've always felt like the second verse was a very personal verse for you in terms of the way it related to, um, you know, the passing of your dad and stuff like that. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, that was kind of like a little line I threw in at the end. And that's the thing about Inner Speaker. Well, the thing about all my albums is that they've gradually gotten more and more personal because I've gradually gotten more confidence to say what I want to say mm. and say what I'm feeling. Like, even kind of like Inner Speaker, 
those lyrics were 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 like for me it was the album where I kind of buried them the most in kind of metaphor and vagueness because it was suddenly I suddenly had this audience you know and I kind of I was kind of like hiding behind what happens if they hear me tell these stories? yeah exactly it was kind of daunting so like it's it's kind of been this process of me being able to like cut off a bit of myself and put it out there more and more each time you know because the first time I did it was kind of, like lonerism was kind of the first album where I um, started really kind of singing person singing personally the reward for me like personally was so great it was kind of addictive you know yeah I was that was my next question was for those artists who are watching this or creatives who feel that sense of trepidation before they put themselves on the line the deeper you go what what do you get out of it the reward is doing it like straight up just like even before anyone else hears it it's like in the way that therapy is kind of just like talking about your problems anyway i know that other family members of mine are like surprised that i'm so stable the only thing i think of is that it's because it's music you know i've got music the song instant destiny mm -hmm. which is kind of like to me sort of sounds like like an immediate sort of th thrust into the unknown and just let's just see what comes up and see totally. what happens that's it. um what's the story behind making that that song and how you got the sound and the feel for it that was one of those kind of like lightning bolt ideas to the head. I bought a um, exercise bike. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Fitness I was on an exercise last. bike. Probably I was actually going real hard, as hard as I go, you know. And uh, I don't know what it was. I just had the idea for the song, the whole thing. You Out know. of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Did you finish the course? Did you finish the, the circuit? Probably not, because any, any old excuse, you know. <laughs> you still doing it? Yeah, I'm on the treadmill now. It's good for the head, man. But I mean, that's the thing, like, like I'll, I'll do anything that gets me inspired. Anything that kind of like gives me, that puts me in the, uh, causes those lightning bolts, you know? Even with this album, yeah. um, I was doing things that like made me uncomfortable just for the purpose of being creative. Cause like, I, I'm, I'm the most creative when I'm, when I'm uncomfortable. You like know? what? Like I hate being stoned in public. So I'll like get stoned and go, go to the shops. <laughs> So, and uh, yeah, I, I wrote a couple of, <laughs> I, the, the start of one of the songs was, was from that, you know. Which just, one? Uh, Breathe Deeper. Uh-huh. I started that song like that. Just from going down the road high and just decided, just to, just to absorb it. Yeah, yeah. When you speak to people about Tame Impala and especially seeing you live on the last run last year, there was a lot of people on drugs watching your shows and coming away having had serious, life-changing experiences. I mean, if you okay. went and checked out any of the comments that came after shows, people are just like, well, that was the best night I've ever had on drugs. And so, <laughs> and so I sort of wonder like, if drugs have ever kind of been part of the DNA of Tame Impala, you know, from a sort of, not from a cliche corny point of mm -hmm. view, but just from a sort of e exploration, a dive into, into, into that uncomfortable space. I don't think that they're like a reason for it being, or like something that's necessary. It's like part of it, but it's not, it's not like the, the be all and end all, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like to say that like some songs would exist if it wasn't for like me being stoned sometimes would be wrong, you know, because some of them do, you know. Is it true you got high on mushrooms and buried all your arias in the backyard? I buried one. I buried one. But out of like, as an act of like? There's some friends around my house and um, I use them as door stops. You use your awards as doorstep. Wow, they're heavy. Yeah, so I think someone brought one outside and they were kind of looking at it and I had this, this idea to bury it. I don't know why. Did you dig it up? No. It's still there? No, the, the whole idea is that it'll be there until the end of time. Or like aliens coming down in like 200 years. I like to think of how it will get dug up, mm. you know, because that's kind of like, at what point is this thing going to see the light of day again? I mean, I don't know, I was gonna ask if you like are an Easter egg kind of guy, like are there things in albums that you, do you like the process of planting things and, and keeping us interested that way? I love the idea of like putting codes in there, like, you know, putting things that like only someone will find in like a few years. But by the time, by the time I'm deep in, deep in it and trying to get it all finished, it's like the furthest thing from my mind. Yeah, I just, like, I just wanna get this good thing finished, you know? Especially when you're making a song like, you know, Posthumous Forgiveness, which is like an expansive, crazy two-part sort of suite almost. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, easily the most kind of progressive structure on the record in that regard. Yeah. Um, I feel every one of your albums has this kind of cornerstone, heartbreaking kind of moment to it. I mean, like I wrote that song over a few months, so it wasn't, that wasn't like a, it was, it was never meant to be a two-part 
song. It was kind of just like two things that I had. Mm. And um, once I kind of decided what I wanted the song to be about and how I was going to sing it, I wanted the vocals to be kind of meandering. And the, I wanted the first half to have this kind of like confused rage. And the second half was this kind of... More of a relief. Relief, yeah, yeah, exactly. This kind of like the sunshine after the rain kind of thing. The drums on this record, I mean, I got to nerd out for a minute because we don't, I think it's one of the first things we ever spoke about years ago. By the way, mm. LA is turning it on with all the audio. It's been amazing. This is the full outdoor oh, experience. Yeah, totally. We've got the lawnmower, we've got the helicopter, the sirens, we've got the barking <laughs> dogs. This is outdoor living at its best. Um, yeah, I got to nerd out about the drums for a second. Yeah. Um, I know there was a moment when you were being sued for um, a loop that okay. someone had said that you had you had unlawfully used mm -hmm. without clearance, mm -hmm. but you were able to prove that you had replayed that loop within an inch of it's like it was you playing the drums on it, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, it wasn't like I was trying to recreate that loop. Yeah. I think maybe subconsciously that was one of my influences. Yeah. In playing the drum beat, that kind of like hip hop swing kind of but thing. But what fascinated me about the story, about the fact that the drums were so authentic sounding that he initially couldn't tell the difference between his original loop and what you had Something played. Like that. Something which like is that. crazy. I mean, that's madness to think that somebody can't de determine the difference between what they made 40 years ago and what you made four years ago. It's kind of a mad thing. So how would you describe your approach to the rhythm of what you do? Because it's such an important part of what you do. Drums have always played such an important mm -hmm. part of Tame Impala. I almost feel like you're a drummer above anything else. Well, yeah, it's true. I believe so. Like the rhythms for me are almost more important than the actual melodic like chords and stuff themselves. Like outside of drums and percussion and stuff, like the, the rhythm of the vocals, the rhythm of the bass line, every, like all the rhythms going together is to me, to me that's like the cornerstone of Tame Impala music. And has always been without me realizing it, you know? And so this album, I just really wanted to explore that more, you know, and push it further. The thing about like influences for me and like recreating stuff that I love is that I want it to be subliminal. Like if I'm influenced by a song that I've heard years ago, or if I sort of start working on something and it reminds me in some way of something that I used to love like years and years ago, yeah. I purposely won't listen to it because I like the idea that, that my memory of that has kind of warped it, you know? So rather than be influenced by something that exists, I like the idea that I'm influenced by my mutated memory of it. So it's gonna be kind of like different anyway, you know? So if, if it is like a 60s drum sound or like a song, like a 60s kind of like break beat or whatever, I like that it's kind of my memory of it, which is gonna be more kind of like crunchy and more weird. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's your interpretation rather yeah. than, a, like, than you sitting there listening trying to do note for note. You know, talking about kind of like reshaping memories and things, is, is one of the best songs on the record is, is uh, Lost in Yesterday, which is, um, it's definitely a new rhythm for you. It's a new feel for mm -hmm. you. It's kind of an up tempo. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost got kind of an early Chris Blackwell Island Records kind of like percussive okay. kind of bop to it. Cool. So that's kind of a deeply reflective record. There's one great line in there, right? Which is when is it terrible memories? Eventually, terrible memories turn into great ones. Yeah, turn into yeah. great ones. What was the sort of inspiration behind that song? Just an idea that I had in my head um, at the chords and the groove and the melody, and it was one of those ones where it like. I didn't intend it to turn, for it to turn out the way it did um, musically. I think in my head it was a lot more kind of electronic, mm. you know, kind of 80s. And like the, the lyric Lost in Yesterday was just something that kind of, I just blurted out when I was recording demo vocals for it. And were you doing all this still on your own? I mean, did, was, did you approach this album primarily as another solo, as another solo venture? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think probably early on in uh, working on Lost in Yesterday, I thought it might be like, a pop song that I could work on with someone else. Mm -hmm. As soon as I got properly working on it, I was like, oh no, this is Tame Impala, you know. Were you tempted at all coming from that kind of collaborative era, that stage where you were just moving around in other people's space to bring other people into the Tame Impala? Because Dave Fridman's worked with you before on a Tame Impala mm -hmm. record, so there has mm -hmm. been experience where you've opened the doors to other people. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a thought in your mind you might do that on this album? Uh, yeah, that was an idea. It's still something that I'm, I'm kind of playing with. It's kind of. It's dicey though, you know, because for me it's like a sacred space, you know. And so, I like, I love the idea, like, I, I love the idea of writing songs for other artists and producing stuff and doing that like really easily. But if it's Tame Impala, it's like a different. Tough when the table's a different. different uh, well, it's just a different kind of um, part of music for me, you know. But it might be something that happens in the future, hopefully. Yeah, but not on this album, it's purely you. That's right, yeah.
when does it get toughest? When's the toughest part of making a process when you're on your own? Because that, that shouldn't be forgotten. When you're making an album mm. as deep as this on your own, mm -hmm. that's a rabbit hole. Yeah. And so wh when is it at its most challenging for you? Like, wh what's the hardest part? Ah, uh, the end. Because that's when you have to make decisions and I'd do anything to be able to share the burden and like responsibility with someone else. But like, and, you know, I have people that I work with, like my, my label guy that tells me what, that I, that I trust, yeah. But at the end of the day, like comes down to me, you know, and it's kind of like, it's my, it's on my, um, it's on my head or whatever, you, whatever the saying is. So like right at the end where it's kind of like crunch time, you know, it's when, uh, that's when the insanity happens, you know? <laughs> This, even like just doing this walk gives me that, that kind of like, so I've done this, this walk down the stairs. Like, oh, you're getting anxiety just coming back in oh, here. Oh, it's just like such a potent kind of memory, you know. This is a beautiful space to create in. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty stripped view. back at the moment. This has kind of just been the kind of, I was just kind of like mixing and doing vocals here and like kind of just touching up. Towards the end, it was just all day, every day. So what was the longest like, you yeah. went through without getting any significant sleep? Uh, the last, well, the last session was like 24 hour. <laughs> yeah, well, because mastering was at um, 10 a.m. New York time. Mm. So like the day before I woke up at like eight o'clock in the morning. And went just, straight I, was like, I was like, right, I know what I have to do. I've got 24 hours to finish the album. I finished at seven in the morning or something. I am one of the songs I started. <laughs> Uh, uh, 11 o'clock the night before. Is It True was only like half done. About, That's one of my About favorites. seven hours before mastering. And I can't, but I kind of liked the idea that it was just this like, you know, all my songs kind of, I spend so much time on them mm. and it's kind of like, I want it to feel like it was, I want the songs to be kind of considered. I wanted them to be kind of considered, you know, and mm. not labored over, but considered. But with Is It True, I was like, I just want it to be like a power, power song. It's just like, you know, writing in a few hours. How big is the first place that you recorded? The, the first bedroom was it at your one of your parents' house when you um, first started making Tame Impala record in relation well, to this space? Like, it was just like a desk. I didn't have much gear, you know. I had like my eight track and, I, mm. and my guitar. You know. And your drums? I did drums at the at the pub down the road, right? Because they, they just let me go there during the day, and because they had mic stands and mics and stuff, which I didn't have. And what were you recording it onto? Onto your laptop? Uh, I had an eight track, little like um, digital eight track. So all the drums on like half full glass of wine, and everything else were done in the pub. Done all at the uh, Norfolk basement. Yeah. And just down there on your own, kind of imagining what it's going to be like to play over the top of them, getting a good drum track and taking it back. Mm, no, what I do is I get heaps of songs ready to go with no drums on them, and then play along. And then I'd have like six hours. And they're like, right, I've got to do all the drums in six hours. We'll be like, boom, one song, just hit record. Just do one take, and then like, next song. That's the sound of the Norfolk basement. <laughs> There's a moment on the record that's so fantastic. That's, again, it's a drum moment. I think it's during Tomorrow's Dust. Mm -hmm when the drums come in and they're on that kind of four on the floor thing to the last part. Okay, Is that, is yeah. that the track? Yeah, that's a real, I mean, there's so many great moments. I mean, it's a dance floor record really, right? I mean, in a weird way, it's like it's, I mean, Currents was, but Currents was also still had mm. that very kind of like deep, you know, very kind of, it was like a very deep experience. Sure. This one feels like it's, there's a lot of groove and a lot of movement. That's what people tell me. You can't hear it? I had, well, I had no idea. Like I was listening, I was kind of just listening to this album, some of the songs this morning just to kind of refresh my mind, you know, yeah. for this interview. I was like, I have no idea what this sounds like. I have no idea. But that, it's kind of the same as it is with every album. It's only like years after I've finished something that I kind of have any kind of clarity, any kind of clarity. Because you're just in the moment trying to get it to the point where you, you, you can live with it, love it, let it go. Yeah, like when I start working on it, I'm kind of out of my head, I don't really know what I'm doing. And then I only get less and less, as it gets more and more towards the end, I have even less of an idea of what it, what it would be like to listen to this from an outside perspective. You know, like what it, what it would be like to hear this for the first time. I would, like, think that's a weird... I, I would pay any amount of money to be able to listen to it for the first time. Do yeah, you know what I mean? Totally do, because I've, I've talked to loads of artists about this over my life, about the, the kind of like, this is the sort of bittersweet trade. That you get the process, which as you said, that's the ultimate reward. But we, mm. get the, we get the first impression. We get to live with it and love it and like have sure. this burst of energy and excitement yeah. when we hear something. Mm -hmm. What have you sort of listened to 
uh, it's hard when you're making your own music, but what are sort of the, can you think of any recent artists or projects that have really kind of had that experience when you've listened to it, you've been like overwhelmingly excited by what one of your peers has made or, one, or someone's made? Well, yeah, frequently. And how do you find that experience? You know, do you, you're obviously a fan of music. Do you let it influence you or try to keep it as somebody else's experience and away from what Tame Impala's doing? Yeah, I mean, like, well, I mean, while I'm working on music, it's like impossible to listen to other music without it uh, getting on top of you, you know? This year, I've listened to virtually no other music, you know, which is, which is kind of like embarrassing in a way, but. That's the um, job. It's the job, yeah, and it kind of just like, like when I'm working on my own music and listen to other music, it just sounds so good, you know? It just sounds too good, you know? <laughs> it's, it's finished. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. It just sounds so fresh and new and like yeah. amazing. So it kind of just like listening to other music, especially that's good, it has a different effect on me. Well, it's funny because Patience isn't on this record. And yeah, mm. I felt like that was the first step towards this album. It's like Patience came out, Coachella's announced, mm. SNL, here we go, Summer of Tame Impala. You know, now we've got Borderline, yeah, let's roll. Mm -hmm. And then something sort of stopped that train from rolling. What, what happened? And where were you in, the, in terms of the creation of that album by that point? Because I know you must have had more songs or you wouldn't have put Coachella yeah, yeah, on, yeah. The, on sale. Exactly. Like, it's, it's, still, it's still one of my babies, you know, I still love Patience. It was always meant to be on the album. It was only kind of like, when I was trying to, I was getting all the songs together, working, working out what was going to be on the album, it just didn't, it just didn't make it, you know? Like, like, some songs don't go on the album because they were born too late, because they were, like, started too late. Do you have songs that we've never heard, though? I mean, are there songs that you... Well, obviously, yeah. But I don't, I don't really, like, I don't get anywhere near finishing a song unless I know it's going to be on the album. Yeah. Unlike, except for Patience, which, you know, we released, obviously. But why do we not get the album in, in that summer of 2019? Like, we, and it's not like, a, it's not like a sort of dark question. It's a genuine sort of, I think people were expecting something, and I don't know whether that mm. was us just being... Present. I was expecting something. Well, there you go. I mean, we, we were sort of taking your lead. What, why did you need the extra time, or what, what sort of got in the way of you wanting to get the album out? <sighs> it just didn't feel right. Um... I mean, like, I, know what, I knew what I needed to do to finish it. Like, I was kind of, like, putting myself under the pump to, um, to get what I needed to do done, and it kind of just felt forced, you know? It didn't feel right. It just goes to show how kind of, like, delusional I was that I could finish the album before Coachella, that it took me another, like, six months. You know what I mean? I feel bad, you know, because we always put this pressure on our favorite artists to give us something. Yeah. Some music, some information, something. We're all so impatient and insatiable these days. And more often than not, even the most considered human beings feel this kind of desire, like, all right, cool, it's coming, it's coming, you know. And then it's, we hold you to it. And yeah. we're like, well, where is it? You said it was going to come in the summer of 2019. Like, where the fuck's the album? Like, it's yeah. Like, it's all part of it. It's all part of it, man. All part of the um, weird trade. Like, no pressure from other people or, like, the record label or fans or whatever competes with the pressure I put on myself, you know? Like, the, the most pressure is always from, from yourself, you know? When did you start it? You started at mid-2018, right? Yeah, like late 2018 and kind of started. And then, I know you got caught up in the fires, which must mm -hmm. have been scary. I mean, how serious was that? I mean, people always said that, I mean, I've heard varying different stories, but the one that seems to be the most common is that you were literally out the door with the travel bag. Yeah. Well, I, I never thought I was in any danger. I checked my phone to see what was going on. I got the evacuation. Thing. And um, I was like, oh, I guess I better get out, you know. Like, I, I've, I've never, never been in that situation before, believe it or not, being in, from Australia, you know. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. I didn't, I didn't, I thought, I thought I'd be coming back in a few hours and I just grabbed my laptop and my bass guitar, just kind of, just in case, you know. Um, and then it all, it all happened, you know. And you lost, everything else was gone. Yeah, it was an Airbnb that I rented, so it was only all, it was like all the recording gear I'd been using was rented. At that time. Oh, no, it was, my, it was my stuff. Wow, so you lost a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. A lot of synths, a lot of equipment. Uh, and a lot of, yeah, just, just equipment, you know, miscellaneous. All the stuff I need to make a song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, I mean, when you, know? you, when you, I mean, realize that that's gone, looking back on it now, did it affect the sound of the record, having to go and kind of start from a fresh perspective and losing a lot of the things that you were comfortable using? In a way, I think what's more weird to think of is, like, I was meant to be there for a whole week, and uh, it was after the first night that the fires started coming at Malibu. So I was meant to be there for a week. I was meant to be there for like, you know, five more nights, in which time I definitely would have written new songs that probably would have gone on the album. Well, may or may not have gone on the album. So like, the fact that that happened means there are songs that don't exist that would have otherwise, you know? You know, right now it's like, whether you're in California or Australia, which is going through this kind of like, 
I mean, it's just this most horrendous, mm. catastrophic mm. situation with the with the bushfires, mm. and 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 it's it's only going to get hotter out there if, mm. if if previous kind of seasons and temperatures. Or well, anything if to go science by. is science, yes, yeah, science exactly, <laughs> and and yes, of course, even outside of Australia, this is just to some degree a significant reminder that we're in trouble. Um, you know, and I and I think about. I mean, you were just down there, right? I mean, what's the tone of the country? I mean, are people angry about the way that things are going in terms of like the the reaction to it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of just chaos, like emotional chaos, everyone's just doesn't know what to do. It's, I mean, it's, it's unprecedented, you know, like they're doing things that, like they're sending a ship around like the corner of Australia with like supplies because they're like, well, let's, let's do that, you know, only, like yeah, the only because there's no precedent to this happening. No one, this hasn't happened before on, on this scale, you know. You know, being someone who travels the world, and I mean, I, I said this to, today on the show actually, that we sort of are a, a hypocritical era and I don't mean that as a, as a self-reflecting insult or an insult on others, it's just a fact of life, like, there's a certain grid within which we've been trained to exist. The way we travel, mm -hmm. the way that we digest and consume. Now we have to like pickle that apart. And some things are much easier for us to reduce or eliminate. Mm -hmm. And other things like travel are proving very tricky until there's actually a, some kind of clear, you know, a way that we can completely reform how we travel and yeah. how we use energy to do yeah. that. So as an artist, knowing that you're going to tour and everything else, yeah. and this isn't to put the responsibility on you, no, but no. is it on your mind? Do you think about that? 100%, yeah. It's tricky, you know, it's real tricky. We're talking with a few different like groups and companies that like their job is to make an artist or bands tours. Carbon green. neutral. Carbon neutral, carbon yeah. Even, yeah. So there's a few different ones where I'm looking at them and like how to work with them. So we're doing a bit there. Um, obviously it's like flying, flying is hectic. And uh, it's from, you know, from the moment that someone brought it to my attention, I've been thinking about it. It's weird though, cause it's like, my job at the same time. Yeah. You know? And also I think like the fact that every night we we have a giant stack of speakers and a massive screen behind us and like thousands of people in front of us, there's an opportunity, Jeez. you know? I mean like it so happens that I, I, I imagine most of my fans don't need to be converted or have it brought to their attention, but that's a thing, you know, and if you play considering festival. doing that, using that platform to just, even in your own way, not in a way like, okay, you know, in your own way mm -hmm. to, to, to try to influence people's thinking. In a way, I think that that's kind of maybe the most power that I have is that audience, you know, or just that platform. Um, you, you really found a way to kind of take what you make each time and make it bigger without, I think, becoming um, abstract from what you started out doing. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the last Tame Impala live experience, the festival experience, the Primavera, the Coachella experience, people are saying that's like the best, not only the best Tame Impala live show yet, but also like one of the best live experiences in terms of visuals and recreation that you can have. So it sounds to me like you've really taken to that side of it and you really love it. Because like I said, when we first met, it was just you and the guys going out on stage and so just making it yeah. up. There was no visuals really, there was a backdrop. Mm -hmm. Do you like that side of the artistic process? Absolutely. As soon as I realized that was like, Possible. Another, <laughs> that, that was possible, yeah. Or that was like um, an area that I could get involved with creatively. You know, because playing live used to terrify me. I used to be like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I'd rather just be in the studio, you know. Yeah. But as soon as I realized it doesn't have to be, that we don't have to like scale it back. We don't have to like, we don't have to be humble, you know, on stage. We can, we, it, it doesn't have to be understated. You know, like I always thought like, oh, you know, Keep it real. Turn, yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep it real, you know, don't, don't. But as, as soon as I realize it doesn't have to be like that, it can be something amazing and big and, but still good and, uh, and real and legit. Then that's kind of when I started having fun with it and, and. Building spaceships. Building spaceships, yeah. Building giant six ton rings. <laughs> How do you know when it's time to kick in again? How did you know that you had something that you want that you wanted to start? It was the starting of an album? It was just a feeling, you know. I just realized that there was sort of like parts of the fulfillment of making music that I couldn't get with songwriting and producing and DJing, I guess. Like, you know, making a Tame Impala album or making a just making a Tame Impala song. It like satisfies a part of me that nothing else can. 
to take that out on the road and to, and to put it into arenas and, and headline festivals and stuff, you've got the band. How is that process of kind of taking a new album that you've sort of taken from start to finish and presenting it to the guys and then getting it ready for live? Like, it's almost like conducting, isn't it? It's almost like you have to tell them what the parts are. We've gotten it down to a pretty fine art. Like, um, I just give them the album. <laughs> the guys are so good. They kind of know how I play and they, they kind of know, you know, how, how I approach a song and like how I kind of play bass guitar and stuff like that. They know that like some, some parts of mine I played like once, once with one hand and chopped it up and then like looped it for the whole song. Mm. It's not like they have to play it exactly how it is. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They can yeah. kind of have fun with it. So we have fun with it, you know what I mean? We're not super tied up to like exactly how it is on the album because it can never be, you know? Like the sound of a Tame Impala album is someone layering hundreds of things on top of each other at some times, you know? And like sometimes there'll be a keyboard sound that happens for like two seconds and then it'll disappear, you know? So it's like with that in mind, we just make it work with a band. Because I think the most important thing is that like we're enjoying it and, and that it sounds good, you know? And that it feels good. But that said, this album's gonna be interesting for playing it live. This album more than ever, I just didn't think about a band playing. I, I didn't imagine, it didn't come, like, like the songs weren't written from the format of like a band. You know, like with, within a speaker, it was obviously I was imagining like it being played by a band and less and less as the albums goes on. Like, so some of these songs are kind of just like, to me, it sounds more like just an electronic producer. Even just the way the other songs relate to this one, because it's such like this tangible feel to this album. Mm -hmm. I mean, how you cherry pick the songs that are going to relate to this album. The currents will obviously yeah. lean, lean in more, more, more easily, but even a song like Elephant, which keeps the tempo, but has a different, totally different tone. Yeah, it's funny, like, my appreciation for Elephant has just grown over the years, as, as, as the more we've been playing it live. I used to, I used to kind of, I was, I was started out being like, Cringed by it because it was so like rock, just straight up kind of. Well, because like, of the rhythm, because like. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, yeah. Well, because the whole the whole part, the whole point of the song at the, the start was kind of like bordering on comical. The rest of lonerism was so kind of washed out and mm. and um, dreamy that I just wanted there to be like one rock stomper, you know, just almost as yeah. almost almost comedically. Which is why it's good to like push yourself, you know. It's and it's why it's good to go outside your comfort zone. Sometimes I some some like. Times I put things in music that I'm almost doing it with a sense of humor. Knowing that people won't think it's funny, they'll just either think it's cool or it's sh you know. But for me, it's like, that's how I know that I'm going outside of my comfort zone, is if I'm like, oh, people are gonna go like, he can't do that. You know what I mean? Is oh, is he, is he really doing that, you know? unusual experience or memory that you had when you were making the slow rush like what's one of the sort of prevailing memories that you have of making this album I guess just uh, any of the kind of um, songwriting trips that I do on my own I just kind of I get an Airbnb the one in Malibu was one of them you know I just rent an Airbnb and just go away for a few days no human contact you know what's the furthest to field you went probably down south from Perth it was like a few hours away. It's never that far because I got to drive. I got to drive there and back, you know. So what about reading and stuff like that? Are you kind of like into that? Do you read books and things like that? Do you search for inspiration outside of your own kind of experience? Yeah, a little bit. Not as much as I should. Like last year, I didn't absorb anything. It was kind of just. It was all output, you know. But I, I want to discover like new music. I was watching this interview with Tyler the Creator, and he said he wakes up every morning and listens to two hours of new music yeah. that he hasn't heard before, and yeah. that's. That's fucking amazing. Yeah, I, I, I want to do that, you know? Yeah, I've just started reading this book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F. It's cool. It just, all it does is just, it just recalibrates your idea of what's important to you and not important to you. Yeah. Do you have a fairly good idea of what moves and motivates you now? Are you able to block out the irrelevant and stay focused? Is that, is that work for you? Not as much as I'd like to, but that's, that's, the kind of, that's the goal, right? You know, that's like creative mecca, isn't it? Yeah. Like being, out, being, being so focused, you know? I dream of being like that and I hope to achieve that and I think I can, you know, of just like creative focus. So are you kind of into the idea of being away from your space and going out on the road? It's sort of like you've got to balance one from the other or can you now create an environment whilst you're touring and traveling where you can stay creative? Can you even do that? Is it in your... Yeah, I think so. Like some of my most creative times are traveling because it's like, because you're, sometimes you're rushing, you're stressed. Like for me, that's the time when I think of music the most, you know. It's funny, people, are, people that I speak to are like, 
you know, I'll, I'll tell people I'm sorry the album took so long. And they were like, oh, no, you've been touring, you know? I was like, but for me, that's not really an excuse. It's like, surely it takes as long as it takes, right? It's Rick Rubin that said, like, it's done when it's done. For sure. That'd be someone, I mean, would you ever, would you ever want to go and kind of get into a collaborative space with someone like a Rick and other producers, not even on a Tame Impala thing? Like, where, where are you going to take that? The idea of writing for other people. You talked about um, that song initially being, um, could have been, mm -hmm. belonged to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, oh, man. Are you like, still into it? I feel like I haven't really even scratched the surface, to be honest. Like, I know that people know that I've done a bit of that, but f like to me, it's not like I haven't even really dipped into it, you know? Like, I want to do that so much more. I want to get uh, better at it, you know? I want to do all that kind of stuff that fulfills me. Last question, last song on the album's called One More Hour, and mm -hmm. first song's called One More Year, last song's called One More Hour. And again, that was a deliberate kind of like from year to hour scenario, or it just landed that way? I wanted it to feel like the start of the album was setting out a year and then like one more hour was going to be the last hour of that year you know like where have we come to and the sentiment kind of that seems to go toward the end is like as long as i get that time to be by myself to remember who i am right to be yeah it's kind of saying like how do how do i go forward from here you know like how do i justify going into the future one of the answers to that is like as long as i can uh, be who i am you know when you finish up this process if each album is kind of like a your experience translated into music that you can then share with us, that's what you took from the experience to a degree, that, that last yeah. song. I guess the question is, what's the kind of prevailing emotional feeling you're left with after making this album? Mm. Nothing, I'm empty. <laughs> I, it's how I feel after every album, especially this album, I'm just like drained, just, I've just given everything. There's a strange emptiness every time I finish an album because I feel like I have nothing left to say or give, you know, I've kind of, everything that I, am right now is in this album. Put it out into the world and people hopefully like it. Oh, and man. People, people bond with it, you know. And then maybe in a, in a few years time, I'll listen to it and like be able to enjoy it again. That's, that's as much as I can hope for. Well, I love it. Thanks, man. Start to finish, it's such a fucking great ride. Thanks for your time, man. Thanks, dude. Thanks for coming to my house.